Salvation. We, we just say there is no power like the, the power of you, Father. Father, we just place our trust in you today. We just, we just roll cares upon you. We thank you. Every prayer is on that empty grave. Thank you, Father. Just as you said. Just as you said. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for just working in our hearts today. Breakthrough. Miracles. What you couldn't do on your own. Released. Just released from. Released to. Thank you, Father. We honor you in this place. Lord, we're looking to you. Our eyes are our eyes are fixed on you today. As if like a child that looking to receive. Thank you that you've prepared good things for us. That you desire to bless and empower your children to heal. We just look to you with great expectancy. We thank that you thank you that your hand is always stretched out towards us. So we do we just let you even touch those places that hurt today in our hearts. And we just tell you we trust you. We trust you. We'll take you at your word. We say thank you. Thank you for your precious, precious, precious presence this morning. We magnify you. We make a declaration today that there's no weapon formed against us that'll prosper. There's no weapon formed against you that'll prosper. Every weapon, every assignment, fall in Jesus name in Jesus name thank you father for victory being the story thank you father thank you thank you thank you and everybody said amen 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 uh, you can grab a chair this morning thank you lord thank you worship team and choir and and all the congregation, how many of you know it is, uh, it's not just the stage that sets the atmosphere for what God's wanting to do. It is the assembly. You know, the Bible tells us how they were all assembled in, uh, in one room um, and they were to give God glory. You know, it's easy to uh, get mixed up and, hey, thanks for bringing this up here for me too. I can maybe take double today. Um, uh, it's easy to get distracted about what we're doing in life. You know, um, it's, e it's easy to think that, you know, we know the Bible tells us that God gives us all things richly to enjoy, but sometimes we, 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 we miss why God has assembled the body, and that is uh, ultimately to, 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 to make an appeal to people um, about Christ, about God, about God's love. And so, um, you know what, you, you might not ever go hunting with me, okay, um, you might not ever go fishing with me. I like, those are a couple things I like to do. I, you will never probably ever go golfing with me. Um, <laughs> very few because, but in other words, you, you, we might not, we might not exchange. Um, we might not sit together and have a hamburger. Um, it just might not happen. You know, there's churches are lar large. Um, the assembly and the church is large and it's to continue to grow. It's what God would desire. Um, yet we're unified. Yet we're unified, and it can be easily like it can be easy to 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 um, to to lose sight of what we are doing, and get 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 discontented or get disconnected because maybe you're not the one fishing with that person or that or pastor or maybe and I'm telling you we got to re um, get back into why God has called us together. And the Bible tells us why he's given gifts to the body, right? The gifts to the body was to magnify Jesus. 
So listen, no matter what it is that we're doing, one of the things that we're here to together to do today is to magnify Jesus today. So even the Bible says that when he's lifted up, he'll draw men to repentance. So even today, while there was a worship team up here and there was a choir up here, did you know what we were doing together? We were magnifying Jesus so that he could be lifted up so that decisions could be made. I want to just talk about the word decide, D-E side. I know that it's spelled with a C instead of an I, but I just want to think of it word D-E side. Like you go from one side to the other. That's what happens when you make a decision. You are either set, in, like the Bible tells us, he says, I set before you life and blessing or death and cursing. You choose. Choose which side. Choose which side you're going to be on. And so many times when we're in that place of, of needing to make a decision and see Christ as he is, as he's lifted up, the Bible says he draws men to repentance. He draws them not just to a relationship with Christ, but ultimately to experience salvation. And decisions are made where people decide from the decision of death or, 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 or in darkness, right, to, to, to a, a different side of light and life. This is why it's so important. When we come together, we're a, when we lift him up, when, when I say that, we lift him up. When you with me, when us together, we're doing the same. This is what we're doing. He's drawing all men to what? To repentance. All men includes all. It doesn't just co- count the world. And so there's the repentance. There's decisions that, are, that need to be made. Sometimes we think we're making the right decisions about certain things. And because the light comes and he's lifted up. How many of you know you, don't, you take that candle you know, and you have it under here. But it's when it's lifted high, all of a sudden you see clearly. And even where you thought you were right, the Lord's like, adjust. Decide. 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 D, get out, get out, and you see that you were, you, decisions that you were at, and things, and hurts, and all these kind of things, or, or you're, you decide from that, and you make a change, you make a, and you step over into this place of life. Gosh, isn't that cool that we get to be a part of that with one another? That's what we're doing. That's why, that's what we're doing when we come, when we come together, and when we employ our gifts, even uh, beyond, the, beyond the four walls. The Bible tells us that it is, it is that God is making his appeal through us. Isn't that cool to think? That God himself is making his appeal through us. I was thinking about that, that word, um, appeal, and I looked up definitions, and, and it talks about something that was it's important. Um, but I was just thinking about something that maybe everyone here would understand, the word appeal. Like when you hear somebody say, I'm going to appeal that decision. How many of you ever, uh, have ever heard that term, to appeal a decision? right? Where, um, where a decision is made in the courthouse, right? And so what do they do is they try it again. They, in other words, they want a different outcome. You're, that's, that's ultimately why they're appealing the decision. You know what God is, does with you and me? He makes an appeal to, to the world, to others, because he knows that the decision that they made, that if they got the right evidence... If they got the right evidence, they would come to a different conclusion. And this is what we're doing all, all along. This is what God has called you and me to do, is to make his appeal, to make an appeal, as it were, God himself. This is 1 Corinthians, I think, 5, 19 through 20. It would be as if God himself is making an appeal through us. Isn't that cool to think that God himself, to reconcile, to reconcile people back to Christ. How many of you know that God is in the reconciling business? This is his, this is his role. He is, a recon, he is one that brings together. Brings together. So we know that, that we see that the works of the enemy is, is divisive to divide. How many of you have ever been in one of those friendships where somebody said something about somebody? Or even, you know, it could be, I see you, Izzy. I see you. I see you. I see. Where, where last week you came up and you said, hey, were you talking about... Uh, talking about Alma football when you said we were down and everybody gets quiet. And I was like, no, I wasn't talking about it. Well, yeah, but no, not there, not in that piece. But this is where you could get, in a sense, and I'm, uh, where something would be a, just a little something that would cause a little, uh. yeah. you talking about how we didn't play good? No, I wasn't talking about that. But this is how the enemy would work, yeah. would want to make it. A, 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 you ever have that with friends? Yeah. You ever have that? 
You have that. Listen, you can have that with, with one another on the, on the front row. You can have it with somebody that's not here. You can have it with pastor. You can have it with boss. You can have it with mom. You can have it with dad. You can have it with husband. You can have it with wife. You can have it with all. The, but it's not God authored. It's not God authored. In other words, it's not God written or it's not God spoken. Or let me just say it this way. It's not God whispered. It's not God whispered. There's a lot of whispers, a lot of whispers that are not the Lord, right? And it's important for us to understand that the ministry of Jesus is one of reconciliation. And not only that, the ministry of Jesus is if, if, the, if the body of Christ, the church, so if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that you, you've been recreated, you're a brand new creation, and, and you have been grafted into the body of Christ, set in the body of Christ. And so because Jesus' ministry is the ministry of reconciliation, your ministry is the ministry of reconciliation. Let's go ahead and put up there, and, and I, I just kind of jumped off. Um, and, um, uh, is this Cindy up there? Yeah. Okay. Cindy, you know, I know I gave you notes really way last minute. I was trying to, and I'm not even with them anyway, so I don't even know why we do this, you know? Um, I brought this in pages, and then I tried to organize, and it just... It just wasn't really happening. So I, I um, and so I usually I, I let me just pause and let's just pray over the word before we get into it. Okay, Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for um, just uh, just as you said in first uh, first first Timothy four seventeen. You stood next to me and you gave us the words to minister so that through me your message would be fully proclaimed. Father, I thank you for that today. That your words would be heard, not the words of a man, but yours. Lord, we 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 desire to hear from you. We just say thank you today. We, we, we put your word in the place that it belongs, and that's of authority in our lives, far above our, our own. And we say thank you for speaking to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So 1 Corinthians, um, talking about the ministry of reconciliation. Somebody say, I have a ministry. I have a ministry. You know what ministry means? Service. So you have a service. So if you have a service and you, uh, you have a ministry, that means you are a minister. Somebody say, I'm a minister. So you're a minister. Is this right? Uh, yeah, it was. Okay. I saw you looking up there. and I, Okay, yeah. Um, but so you make, you, I'm a minister. You're a minister. You know what a minister is? It's a servant. It's a servant. And so if Jesus' ministry is the ministry of reconciliation, where he reconciled people back to God, that's why God sent his son Jesus, right? We, we, he sent us, God so loved the world, John 3, 16, right? That, that, that he, he loved the world, so he sent his son so that they could have fellowship again, all right? Well, this is also your and my ministry, my, your and my service. Let's read this verse. It says um, that it is God uh, and, uh, was in Christ, reconciled. God was in Christ. God, it's not just Jesus. Sometimes we get this idea that, Jesus is good and God is bad. You know, like God, big stick, Jesus, open arms. God, big stick, Jesus, open. They're three in one. They're unified. Right? They're three. So, so Jesus, it was God. It was God. God is love. God, yeah, they're, they're three in one. You, you understand what I'm saying? Even just like last week, unity with the Trinity. How many of you were, I'm telling you, go over those notes again. Unity with the Trinity. If I'm going to be unified with the Trinity, it's not going to become because I agree. It's going to be because I agree. I come under what he says. Okay? This is huge. This is huge. So many times we, 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 like, we think we, we should agree with God and, and another, instead of come under what he says. My agreement is not up here. It's th this decision I make from the beginning is God's word is authority in my life. This is how I, I move myself and operate in the kingdom of God. Yeah. Because you've been born, if you've been born again, and I'm talking predominantly to the church, this is where, the, where we're equipped today. Okay? Now, if you're here today and you're seeking the Lord, we're gonna, man, we, want, you, we want to give you an opportunity to pray with you, to receive Christ, all of that kind of stuff, and help heal, all that kind of stuff. But predominantly, when we assemble as a church, the Bible tells us this is where we're equipped. Yeah. But it is, it is as we go out beyond the four walls where, where our lives are to be a ministry and reconcile people back to, to, to Jesus. 
Okay? And so there's this, there's this equipping. I don't know where I was going with that, but um, I'm going to go back to the word. How's that? That it was God reconciling. Uh, it was God. Okay, let me. These are big words. Let me read it back here. I'm like trying to. All right. That it is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word or the ministry of reconciliation. So he, how, how was it that, that, that even the reconciliation began? He said, I'm going to pay the price for you. And that, this is the start of reconciliation. I'm going to pay the price for you. In order to pay the price, he couldn't, he couldn't say the cost was too much. This is the start of our ministry. To reconcile people back to Christ. The ministry of reconciliation to, back to Christ. Back, uh, God, again, starting it out, God is a, a minister of reconciliation. So guess what you and I are? It was given to us. Verse 20, now then we are ambassadors, or we are here on God's behalf um, for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, imploring you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. So he's making his appeal through us. Different translations say God is actually making an appeal, coming again for reconciliation to take place. How, how is it that you and I um, reconcile uh, people back to God? is when, when they see God in us. So many times we hear this, um, this, this statement, well, you just got to walk in love. Anybody ever heard that? Isn't that always in a hard time? Like, like it's always something that's like, oh, I know I shouldn't do this, but I really want to do this, but I know my wife just said you should walk in love or your kids say you should walk in love or your dad says you should walk in love or, or your friend says, well, is that love, you know? And so we choose love to get through, you know? I, th- instead, of, instead of like this understanding that my love is actually what other, it's the evidence that's the appeal for the world and his people to experience God. My love is actually the appeal. It's the evidence. There's a scripture that says this. Um, It says that they will know. They will know God by our love for who? One another. So me walking in love is not so much about um, me getting through. And me not being frustrated, offended, hurt. All these kind of things. It is about a mission that's far greater than me. Um, far greater than me. On mission. My love and how, how I respond is all about God's appeal. As it were, himself with me, in me. So that others could experience and make a decision, make a decide, and get out of a, this place of translated from the kingdom of darkness or the rule of darkness and into the kingdom of God's light, the rule of light. Anybody, anybody ever felt like you just are in the rule of darkness even though you've been translated? I, okay. Um, that's not... Um, you're not alone in that. The enemy would love to, to steal, kill, and destroy. This is his assignment. Um, but love doesn't fail. Isn't that, isn't that interesting, amazing that love doesn't fail? I want to um, uh, talk this morning um, by, uh, and go ahead and go into the title of my message. I'm not going to blow it because that would be loud. Whose call? You know, anybody watch basketball? We just entered basketball season, at least high school basketball season. Um, we went to a ball game uh, yesterday. We watched the Razorbacks. It was cold, and we lost. But there's a whistle. These, these, these referees are actually paid, not paid off. 
as we sometimes think. But we actually hire them to govern a game so that we can play. And yet, we hire them. And when they make a call, oftentimes we like to do what? Yell at the call, question the call. I mean, depending how, you know, where you're at. I mean, we like to, we like to question the call. Whose call is it? Whose call? It's the rest call. What if you don't agree? Well, you, you know, the culture is, it's so extreme where we want to make our own call that just, oh, maybe seven, eight years ago, we instituted this thing called red flags in the NFL. Now, you know what I'm talking about? You know what you do? I don't like the call. Challenging that call. And, and you know, because we have video evidence, indisputable. Come on, help me out. Indisputable evidence. Isn't that amazing how when we, when we don't like a call, it, it's because we have evidence. We've seen something different. We saw something different. And even sometimes when they say uh, they don't overturn the call, or it, it, you know what's crazy? When they do overturn the call, it's kind of like, told you. <laughs> I don't even need that whistle, you know. I mean, they should put that, you know what I'm saying? I mean, really, this is how it should be. You know, you need your whistle? You need a whistle? Who, who's wearing their whistle today? Huh? Anybody wearing their whistle? Pastor is. That's right. Whose call is it? But this is, this culture, um, this culture is so prevalent, or this, uh, this, I don't know, I, I guess this is, this, this symptom is so prevalent in our culture, I should say. Um, pervasive that we'd be a fool to think it's not in the church. And you know what happens when they throw the red flag and then the call is overturned? You're just that much more propped up and supported to the high place that you stand. So I would say this, that there is a high place in which the world stands right now. And it's actually opposed to the one that is, has the whistle. Yes. Who am I talking about should have the whistle in our lives? The Lord. The Lord. Did you know that there is things in God's word that, and calls that you once agreed with that because you've risen in your estimation, in my estimation, I'm not just talking to you, I'm talking to we here, um, that you've now made a different call. But it's not under the authority of God's word. Whose call is it? It's God's call. It's uh, authority. So we're going to talk just uh, this morning a little bit about authority. Because this is key to resisting the devil. There's an order. James 4, 7. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Number one. Submission. So we're going to just talk today about some submission because there's something called authority that we don't like to hear about. And so I want to read a little bit about authority. Um, and, and authority is uh, something that's good for all of us, myself included. Okay. Um, sometimes we don't like to be told what to do. I, I, it's funny. I have kids. Uh, I know kids. I have kids in high school sports and I have um, their friends and I've had plenty of conversations that I would like to not repeat because of the way that, not just with sports, with teachers, about teachers. Well, they said this and da da da. It's amazing to me how, how much our kids can challenge authority. 
the liberty that's given in schools. You remember when they used to have this thing called the rod of correction in school? Yeah. Philip used to get spanked about every other day. <laughs> and look how he turned out awesome. <laughs> we don't spank kids anymore in school or at home. And so there's no discipline because there's no authority. And if there's not authority in the home, if there's not authority in the school, and there's not authority in our government, and there's not authority in the church, then whose authority are you under? So when the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, meh, the big bad wolf, guess who's kind of out on their own? We are. Is that true? So do you think uh, we stand a chance? No. What has God given um, the church? Let's just talk, start. He gave them a shepherd. Who's the shepherd? Jesus, right? Um, you ever heard this scripture where it talks about how Jesus is he's the, he's the good shepherd? What does he do? He, he does what? He does what? Somebody help me out. Joe, what, is the, what does Jesus do for the church? He lays down his life? What does he not do? When, if Jesus is the shepherd and he's laying his life down for the, for the sheep, um, the, right in that same passage in John 10, we see that there's also these other hirelings. When the wolf comes, right, they run. But Jesus does what? He takes on the wolf. He lays down his life for the sheep. So he runs out after the wolf. What do you think the shepherd does to the wolf? We don't think about this very often, do we? Because Jesus is love. Right? Jesus is love. So if the wolf is going to come and destroy sheep, what do you think Jesus is going to do? He's going to lay his life down for the sheep, so he's going to take on the wolf. Okay, there's, there's all kinds of, there's, we're talking about authority today. And I want to get back to reading the scripture about authority, because even as I was getting ready for this, um, this, this weekend, I was just like, Lord, I want, I want to be under authority, not just bring a good message. And my, actually, my prayer was, Lord, I want to bring an encouraging word this weekend. That's all I want to do. Like, I just was, I mean, I was praying just for an encouraging word. You know, like, you just want to love people. And I was just like, Lord, give me an encouraging word. Give me a, and I think an encouraging word, sometimes we like to call an encouraging word, like the tap on the attaboy, hug, leave you snotty nosed, and you know what I mean? But an encouraging word, as I was praying that out, um, I saw this word like this. Like, like, like you're encouraged. Like there's a, there's a, you're, a, you're able to stand. And you're not only able to stand, you're, but you're able to advance. And you're able to just take on the enemy who is defeated and who, because of the name that you carry. And all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to the church. And that's to you. So to be encouraged would really be to be empowered. But part of being empowered is understanding God's system, God's ways. And again, because of our culture, it's really simple for you and me to get into the place out of authority and therefore out of protection and therefore on our own, and in a sense, a sitting duck, right? Let's go here. Um, let's go here. How many of you know, even like, uh, we like to make a call. And so we think, uh, you know, we make the call, but God's calls, God's ways are different than ours. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. Uh, and then even when we make a good call, sometimes we think that that's, you know, our good deed. How many of you ever wanted to take out the trash, but then your wife told you to? Okay, I'm the only guy. Thank you, sir. Two hands, three. So now all of a sudden, how many of you guys still want to take out the trash? I don't see any hands. You know Why? Because you wanted it to be your idea, okay? 
This is a, that's just a good example for guys, but you understand what I'm talking about, ladies. There's things that in your life that you wanted to do and you, you had your intention to do, but now because somebody else said to do it or somebody else suggested it, now it doesn't mean as much because it's not coming from you. I wanted to get him that, and I wanted him to know it was from me because I wanted him to know how much I love him. Excuse me. You know, it didn't come from me anymore. Let me tell you, newsflash, any good thing that you do, it didn't come from you. And when we, you and I are trying to do good to somebody and, 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 and let them know that we're doing good for them, we're actually no longer on God's side. Isn't that what Satan wanted to do? Tell everybody how good he was? His goodness came from the Lord. My goodness, your goodness, guess where it comes? From the Lord. Any good, good, any good thing in me, if, if it is good, it's from God. So even my calls, if they're right, it's only because they're God's call, right? So a good call would be a God call, not an eight call. Mark uh, 10, 18, there's none good but God. This is the correction. Isn't that interesting? Jesus corrects this man when he says, oh, good master. And Jesus, who doesn't say anything except for what the Father tells him to say, says, there's none good but God. He wouldn't even receive that for himself. Isn't that interesting? Next, uh, James 1, 17, every good gift. I'm just giving these, I'm giving you these scriptures because I want you to go back and look at them yourself, Okay. Every good gift comes from God. Good gift. You know one of the gifts that God gives us is authority. Authority. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. We're going to read two just, just two just passages uh, real quick this morning on authority, and it'll, it'll make an adjustment in our lives. I'm telling you. It'll, make, uh, it'll put us back under that place of shielding and empowerment. Say, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. First of all, then I urge that petitions, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving be offered for everyone, for kings, and for all those in authority, so that we may lead tranquil and quiet lives in all godliness and dignity. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So I think it's so cool how he puts everyone be saved and knowledge of the truth right there with authority that we need to be praying for. And he, he values both of them. And you know what he also values? He values our prayers for those in authority. Austin, who's in author- who, name some people in authority in your life. Good call. But that, could, that, is, that would be true. I'm, I'm your boss, right, as a, as a youth pastor, but also a pastor, right? So there's two... But who else would be an authority in your life? President. President. Government. Government. Uh, I was going to say that, but then she just said it, so I was going to say <laughs> I was going to say it, but then she said this is So there's people in authority. Let me, let me ask you this, though. Just because somebody holds a rank, are they an authority in your life? That has to do with your what? Submission. Wow. So God's in authority, but he might not be in authority in your life. So this is, has to do with your and, my, your and my will, doesn't it? So authority is all about will. It's all about motive. It's all about the heart. Authority. And so God teaches and he actually sets authority in, in the world because this is an opportunity for you and me to understand and learn, even now, authority. Or the surrendering of my will instead of the exaltation of myself. What if I don't agree with what they call? Does that mean that the authority does, is not right? And shouldn't be? I don't know. Let's look here. Maybe the word will clear something up for us. Romans chapter 13, 1 through 5. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. Isn't this interesting? This is in Rome. To the Romans. Paul's writing to the Romans. Romans, Maximus Aurelius, right? All right. Gladiators. Romans, centurions, hard people. 
They, they won their empire by hard rule that was so hard, the people were afraid of them. Well, you're not supposed to govern out of fear, and da da da. So he said, well, because they're governing out of fear, you should not submit, or, or what? Is this God's word or not? In the church, because we've been made righteous, somehow we moved over to being self-righteous, and now we make calls about a lot of things that is not what God's word says, and we're justified. Because we're justified by Christ, we think that now all of our ways and our thoughts are also high like his thoughts. But the Bible tells us that my, my, I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind as I read the word. Just because I got born again and my spirit was made new doesn't mean my mind has been renewed to the word of God. And there's a lot of things in here that are not under the authority of God's word. Here's one of them. Here's one of them. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. You say, well, the government is not the... Listen, He's talking about a king here. He's not talking about a, a voting. But we, we are in, this, this, in a nation, thank you, thank you, Lord, that we have servants. These are governing authorities. You know what a pastor is? A servant. A servant. That's what they are. You know what a president is? A servant. By the people. For the people. This is what they are. You're like, well, well, they're not that. I mean, if they were that... Well, then do something about it. Are you, are you running for anything? No, you're just... Um, oh, running your mouth. So let me ask you this. Whose mouth, who's the one behind that mouth? Is it God? Because is he double-minded? So you, you're telling me that there's a lot of the church that is partnering with the enemy concerning government? Not just government, Authority. 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 And as long as I question authority, as long as I, I'm not just questioning it, I'm actually opposing it. And what does the Bible tell us? Right in that same passage of James, he who uh, resists the proud opposes the proud. There are calls that we're making and we, uh, 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 in our lives that we're, and we're trying to follow God's plan, but we're making calls that he never called. And so we're actually wrestling against him and we wonder why we can't get past him. You'll never get past God. Like he's the best lineman there is. You're not going to get to, the, to that next thing if, if you're making the wrong call. Let's keep going here. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority. This is somebody underline, highlight, circle, you know, star, draw pictures around this. For there is no authority except that which is from God. Is that in the Bible? My goodness. The authorities that exist have been appointed by God. Oh, they corrupted this, they corrupted that, they corrupted this, they corrupted that. Okay. Sometimes the enemy's allowed to work because the people of God have laid down their shovel because they're too busy with their mouth. So, okay. All right, let's keep going here. Um, consequently, whoever resists authority is opposing God. What God has set in place and those who do so will bring judgment upon themselves. Isn't that interesting that even just resisting authority, you can bring judgment upon yourself? You know what judgment would be? A ju what comes with a judgment is always a consequence. Judgment. It's not just like, oh, you're wrong. Oh, oh, well. <laughs> well. No, ju with judgment comes a sentencing. So there's sentencing. There's bars. I want you to see it this way. I want you to see you're locked up in places in, your, in our lives because we made a call that's not what God's call was. And we think we're right. We think we're right. I'm right. I'm right about this. You know why? Because this, 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 this. Throw that flag. Told you. 
indisputable evidence. Except for what I'm talking about, really, there was something that happened before the play. How many of you ever watched football and saw somebody fumble the ball or an interception take place? However, however, if you don't understand this, if there's an offense that takes place before the offense, or if there's a foul that takes place, or a penalty, rather, that takes place before the offense, it's kind of like this. Aaron Rodgers is great at this. Great quarterbacks are. I'm not saying Aaron Rodgers is a great quarterback, Ev, but you, I know you don't like him that well, but hey, he does it well. Here's one of the things he does well. Oh, they jumped off sides. Great. We're going to take a shot. This is a free shot. So he'll take a shot down the field, right? And he threw an interception. That's all right. We'll just take our five yards instead. So in other words, what happens is, could you throw the flag that there was indisputable evidence that he intercepted the ball? Well, yeah, he intercepted the ball. That was wrong. But tell me what was wrong first. Oh, they jumped off sides. Okay, so here's what I want to ask. What I want to ask you. So many times we confine our judgment to the situation on that spot on the field, like how I dealt with Drew, and the fact that he was holding my arm, but I still caught the ball or whatever. But we don't look back. So let me just. We're going to look back a little bit today about some of your fouls and my fouls. You jump off sides? Anybody here jump off sides? I've jumped off sides. Anybody here know somebody that's jumped off sides? Anybody know somebody here that's gotten fouled that's jumped off sides? So pretty much everybody here has jumped off sides. Or committed a penalty. Let's look at this. I, I, um, let me finish reading uh, through verse 5 here. He says, authority opposed God he, he has set in place, and those who do so will break judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct. In other words, when there's authority, it's not a terror or something bad to good conduct. You don't have to worry. If you're running 55 in a 55 and you see police lights, you don't have to hit the brakes. It's going to be okay. And you don't have to be afraid. Now, when you're going 75 and a 55, you better hit the brakes and go, oh, Jesus, help me, please. <laughs> and then when somebody else gets pulled over on 75 and a 55 because they cut you off, you don't go, serves you right. Well, you do, maybe. That's your call. That's your call. But that's because you forgot the call where you cried out to God for the call of mercy. Okay. They're not to, to, to bad conduct. Do you want to, uh, to be unafraid of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you'll have his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. Be very afraid. For he does not carry the sword in vain. He is God's servant, an agent of retribution for the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to authority, not only to avoid punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. How many of you know that your conscience sometimes is the worst thing to live with. And so there's things in, in our lives when, when uh, a lot of times uh, the torment in our lives is the fact that we've grieved our, the Holy Spirit which is in us. It not, has nothing to do with anything but the call that we made. So we made the call. What call, what, what call am I making? What call are, are, are you and I making? Are we making a call that is the right call? I'm telling you, we'll make the right call if we look at the big picture, let me give you the big picture here, a couple of these verses, and then I want to I look at a, 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 an example today um, about making the call and our ministry of reconciliation. First, let's go to Luke chapter 7. Um, actually, no, 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 let's not go there. Let's go, um, let's go to Romans 3.10. I want you to see this. There's not one righteous, no, not one. You've heard this, right? Maybe you haven't. There's not one righteous... The only righteousness that I have, that you have, is because of the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, who's washed me and cleansed me. It, it, it was him. Uh, look at this next one. I think this would be, maybe sometimes a lot of people, um, they fear this day. Like God has a reel of all your failures, right? 
But look at this, uh, Psalms 130, verse 3. Psalms 130, verse 3. If the Lord kept a record of your sins, you know what it means to sin, miss the mark. Who could stand? Can you imagine if the Lord kept a record of your wrongs? Who could stand? I couldn't stand. Could you stand? No, but he doesn't keep a record of our transgressions. He removes them as far as the east is from the west. Oh, Father, thank you for that call. Thank you for that call. Thank you for making that call. Oh, Father, thank you for making that call. God's calls are right. God's calls are righteous. But you and I have to make a decision as to which call we're going to side with. This is the bottom line. And my call to come under God's word in every situation, no matter how I've been wrong, no matter how much money I owe, no matter, no, no matter what it is, that's my call. That's your call. And sometimes we can get embittered and frustrated because of the things in life. Sometimes we get frustrated with people. Have you ever tried to walk in love with, with somebody uh, for a long time? Anybody? Okay, good. I'm not the only one. But I think everybody here has said in their heart they want a relationship right. Sometimes it's a family member. Okay? Sometimes it's a friend. Sometimes it's a coworker. Sometimes it's a teacher. Or sometimes it's somebody that you just, and you constantly have to what? Try to keep your heart right. How do you keep it right? By sticking to with what God says. So, and what happens oftentimes, um, we, get, we can grow weary in doing what's right. And therefore, we don't reap the harvest. The Bible says, don't grow weary in well-doing. What's well-doing? God's way. He says, in due time, you will reap the harvest. You know what? God keeps his word. So let's look here at this passage, and I want you to see um, something. I want, to see, want you to see a, your ministry about reconciliation, of, and my ministry of reconciliation, and how, how we do it. And I want you to see how important um, coming under authority is, and how coming under authority often takes it most often takes you directing your life with your mouth. Amen. This is why he said, pray for those in authority. Praying, so many times we say, I pray, I was just, man, I was praying for you today. Really? Is this what your prayer looked like? Or did it look like, oh, Father, I lift up Jordan to you today. I thank you just that you'd let her face shine, your, your face shine upon her, that the Sheltons would be blessed. Father, I thank you that they would, they would experience your blessing coming and going and that they would lack no good thing. I thank you for the decisions that they, they are to make, that they, would, that they would have wisdom and they would know that exactly what to do. Father, just pour your great... Okay. So it sounds... That's prayer. This is thinking. I'm just telling you, prayer is not just thinking. The release of my will takes the words of my mouth. I'm telling you, this is huge. Okay? Now, and you're saying, well, you're saying God can't, can't come to you if you think about it? No, I'm just saying, let's look at the principles of the word, and let's, you saying I have to say something? I'm saying, this is what the word says. You mean I have to? Okay, you have an authority issue. When the word brings correction, the, uh, this is what the, you look, the word says it over and over and over. It is with your heart you believe, but it is with your mouth confession is made unto salvation. This is super basic. My mouth positions me. James, your tongue steers the whole ship. My tongue. I, uh, reason I'm going through hell a lot of times is this little guy right here. La, 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 la. Fire? La, 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 la. Yeah, but I was talking about this to help somebody. La, 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 la. You just jumped right in the sludge with them. And you, you're not strong enough 
to try to keep this from where this la, 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 goes. Where this la, 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 goes, you will too. All your soul will go la, 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 where your tongue's at. This is why he tells us to pray for those in authority. You know why? What happened? When you pray for them with thanksgiving, you'll have a heart for them. And prayers will be working and God will be able to move because he answers prayer. Look at here with me. and I, I'm, I'm running. I'm, I'm going to get this just right is what I'm going to do. Thank you, Lord. Let's... Um, Let's, let's, I just want, I, I want to spend just, just a moment here in Numbers, Numbers chapter 20. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read uh, about 20 verses here, so hang with me, all right? 1 through 13. Cindy, uh, kick it down. All right. <laughs> then the children of Israel. We're talking about the children of Israel. We're talking about Moses, okay? We're talking about not just Moses, but Moses, the children of Israel, and Aaron, so you know anybody know who Aaron was? If you don't know who Aaron was, Aaron uh, was uh, was the spokesperson for Moses. I believe it actually was his brother. Is this correct? Okay, and Miriam, Moses's sister. So God had a family. How many of you know God chooses families, right? And so, um, and God had a family. And Moses said, "I can't do what you said." and told me to do because I stutter, I can't speak. And God said, "Aaron will be your spokesperson," right? So you go out of Egypt, let my people go. Aaron's with them, with the rod. Aaron's with them. Aaron's with them at the Red Sea. Aaron's with them at the tent. Aaron's with them everywhere. Aaron's with them when he hits the rock and water comes out and and, and the whole nation is blessed. Aaron is with them. Now here we are picking up in, in the wilderness after they've been in the wilderness for a while and it's dry and they don't have water. It says the children of Israel, the whole congregation came to the wilderness of Zin in the first month and the people stayed at Kadesh and And Miriam died there and was buried there. Let's keep rolling. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. They're upset. They're complaining. I'm just tired. Can you imagine Moses and Aaron? They're just tired of it. God's tired of it, but you can see in these passages, not just this one, but many times, Moses grew tired of the people's complaints. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, if only we had died when our brother died before the Lord. When other, like, I wish we would have died when everybody else died. Now we're just out here with no water. It's like, you're not seeing all the good? You're not saying, no, no, we're just griping. But why have you brought up the assembly? He says, why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our animals should die here? Go on. Questioning authority. Complaining about decisions that are made. Complain, look, and why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's not a place of grain or figs. Again, talking about the land that they're supposed to, of vines or pomegranates, nor is there even water here to drink. Can, what? Seriously? Oh. So Moses ugh, had enough. And Moses went up from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of the meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water from the, out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and to their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. He didn't say to say this. So here we see... Here we see that the children of Israel got on to Moses. The complaining that Moses was around got on to him. And the one that was supposed to lead the people into the promised land, we're going to see here in a moment, didn't get to go. Because of what? Because of what got on him. He said, Moses gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Here now, you rebels, you, must we bring water for you out of this rock? All of a sudden, him and God are like this, instead of like this. There's a change that took place, where his call, 
And what he's now, he's frustrated. He's going to make the call. He, let's keep it going here. Moses lifted up his hand and he struck the rock twice with his rod. And the water came out abundantly and the congregation and their animals drank. Just because something good happens does not mean God authored it or ordained it. Many times you're going to see the goodness and the favor and the mercy of God for the, for, toward, towards other people, not because God, even the anointing on somebody's life. The anointing is not God conferring or condoning a decision. It's God wanting to get something to people. So don't make a mistake about just go because of that, because of that. Oh, because that happened. I guess, it was, I guess it was okay. No, it wasn't okay. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. He said this, this verse. I want you to see this. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. He said, because you did not believe me, to hollow me in the eyes of the children. Go back to one verse. I want to finish reading that again. Verse 11. He said, so he hits the rock, right? And water flows out. Uh, verse, you breeze maybe? I know you're fast. Uh, go to the, verse 11, verse, uh, Numbers 20, 11. Numbers. I know. So what happened is he hit the rock, water flows out of the rock. Yep, thank you. Sometimes it frees, I don't know. Then Moses lifted up his hand, he struck the rock twice with his rod. How many of you know he had to do it twice? God's way... You're going to come out of there. Okay? And water came out abundantly in the congregation, and their animals drank. Verse 12. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, and he said, Because you did not believe me to hollow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I've given them. Did you know that Moses didn't get to go into the promised land? Did you know that Aaron didn't get to go into the promised land? You do now. You know why Aaron didn't go into the promised land? Because he said nothing. He said nothing. He said nothing in the authority and under the authority of God's word. You know what Aaron should have said to the people? He should have said something different than what Moses said about how I'm so upset with you. He should have said, whoa, 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 Moses. That's not what the Lord said. This is part of being under authority. God's authority. And Moses didn't get to go in because of what he did, but Aaron didn't get to go in because of what he didn't do. So be, be mindful that it's not just what you do, it's what you don't do that can keep you out. Because both of those speak of not being under authority. Have you ever been there in that situation where God has given you the ministry of reconciliation, as it were, God making his appeal through you? But you don't, but you don't want to hurt your friend concerning what's going on, so you say nothing. You say nothing about the word, even though in your heart... Pops up. The Holy Spirit brings the word. Uh, but if you bring the word, they might be offended with, with you. With you. Are you under authority? Am I under authority or not? Reconciliation, a ministry of reconciliation, as it were, God making his appeal through us. It takes you and me being as what? An ambassador. Go, let's go back to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. 5, 19 through 20. You're, you and I are ambassadors. You know what that means? I'm commissioned on and under or on the behalf of God. Amen. This is pretty special. That God chose me. God chose you. In yourself, you can't do a lot of these things we're talking about. But the Bible tells us that in, in James 4, verse 6, he says that he gives more grace to the humble. In the Amplified, it says, to meet the evil tendencies of this, of this world. To meet the, 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 he gives more grace. Where does grace come? God's empowerment, God's gift. God's gift, not just to you, but through you to make an appeal. And the evidence would be presented in such a way. Again, God's wanting to make an appeal so somebody can, can make the right call. Oh, guys, I, I, I got to have the right call. 
I got to have the right call concerning, listen, concerning prosperity. I was listening to somebody. They said the only place when you hear prosperity that it's fought after is in the church. You, the, 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 the president could say, we're going to have a prosperous da-da-da. We're going to do this. We're going to da-da-da. But you say that in the church, it's like, ah. Uh. There, there was, a, there was a, a minister that came in here a few weeks back, and he talked on prosperity. I, I, I could sense in my spirit while, while this message was going forth that there was opposition to something that God was wanting to get to us. What God was wanting to get to us is not just for us to be free of offense. It's for us to be provided for. It's not just for us to walk in forgiveness or be forgiven. It's not just a message of eternal salvation. It's to have salvation here and now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with these couple verses, then we're going to receive communion. I want you to see that uh, what, um, let's, let's go here, that Jesus, he's living. Um, let me go here. Thank you, Lord. Romans chapter 5. We were just there talking about authority. Verse 9, it says, Therefore, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from wrath through him? For, for if, we, if, when we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? So it tells us this, that we're saved by his blood, but it is actually his life that causes you and me to experience life. We're saved by his life. Let me go back in verse, I think it's verse 9. How much more shall we be saved from the wrath through him? What does it say on this? How much more, having been justified by his blood, shall we be saved from wrath through him? Go on to the next verse. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through death. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his what? Saved by his life. We are reconciled by the blood, but we are saved by his life. What is he doing right now? What's Jesus doing right now for you? He's interceding on your behalf to the Father. He's saying something. How do I experience God, God right now? This is, I'm just telling you, he's saying, God is say, saying something. I, you know how you and I experience life? Somebody said something. I was listening to this. My wife played this message for me just the other day, somebody's short clip, where somebody was apologizing for telling people the word of God. A pastor. I just want to apologize to all you atheists and people of the world if you've ever been offended by the church by telling you that th this this way is wrong or this that's not our role those are house rules and, I'll, and I get what he was saying in his heart but I'm telling you there is this opposition to cause you and I to come under our own self-rightness and want people to be happy with us instead of preaching the word and planting the word of God and, and, and interceding on behalf by sharing the gospel, the good news, light, seed, life. Jesus is the one up there. His, through his life, salvation comes. So many people have been, uh, just talking to the church this morning, talking to you, church. You've been saved, reconciled by his blood. But there's life that's supposed to be flowing. And, and the life that, we're, that Jesus, we are saved through his life is that he's interceding on our behalf. Let me ask you this. Are we interceding as, on anyone else's behalf? I just... Or are we too busy thinking about the calls that affect our lives and... And just, are we offended by what was said or what wasn't said? Are we, I just want to get us on point this morning. And that's what we're doing with our lives. And encouraging you to move out and move forward and move with God and overcome. And just be about uh, this ministry of what? Reconciliation. 
My life is about reconciliation, reconciling people back to God. The, the, and and, and I, as it were, making his appeal through us. God is working. He wants to use you and me to make an appeal to others. You know what has to happen is it's not just it's my love, but it's also my words interceding on behalf. How what does my prayer life look like? Pastor Chip talked about this last week. And so I'm really pulling off of last week's message. He talked about being in unity with the Trinity. Unity was the last thing that he said. He, he talked about two things, and he, he didn't really wrap up the second one during the, during the first service. Let me, let me give you these notes here. He said this. Repent, and then he said unity. He was talking about being in unity with the Trinity. Being in unity with the Trinity. The very last note, step two, being in unity. Being in unity. Number one was repent. The second one was unity. How do I get in unity with the Trinity? I come under what God has said, but on top of that, how do I bring unity with another person? I can't do it on myself. I can simply choose love and bring again and make intercede on their behalf. And this really goes back to what he talked about that night, praying for others. Prayers, my prayers for you, my prayers for them, my prayers for the world, my prayers for authority. And this might sound, sound crazy. I just had, had sensed so, so strong in my heart that what we're looking for in our lives today is really a shepherd. It's just really a shepherd. And you know who you are on his behalf? A shepherd. We're looking for people to look after us some. But really we need... We really desire Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He's going to lead me by still waters. We, we want the still waters that we're looking for in our own ways and our own desires and not coming under and, and just looking back and saying, God, is this what you say? Lord, is this what you say? So I just, I, I had, in my heart, I said, Lord, how do we, how do we get back into that place where you have authority in our lives? How do we get back to that place where we honor authority again? And I just felt like he was just saying this, become thankful again. There's a lot wrong in this nation. There is. But if authority is going to work, it's going to start by you and me thanking the Lord for this place. Because then I value it. And then even where God has called me to stand up and serve, I won't just see it as a waste of time. I'll see it as a worthwhile investment into a place that God has called me. If, I'm, if there's authority in my that I'm struggling with in my job. There might be some things that are wrong with your boss and the way that they've treated you. But what about when they hired you? What about when they promoted you? What about when you got that check again? And every Friday it was there, even when numbers were down. What about It'll change your and my positioning to come under and to cause even that business to rise. What about your pastor where you have been hurt or offended and what they didn't do? What about, what about when you needed the word for your marriage? What about when the hands were laid on you? And, and life was ministered to you. What about, listen, what about in your marriage? Not about when he doesn't take out the trash. What about when he's got up at four o'clock in the morning for the last five years to put food on the table and to try to make the game? What about 
Man, there's a change that takes place when we look at what God has done, when we look at what others have done, when we look at what, and we become thankful. It changes what it does. Here's what it does. It employs me. The love of God has been shed abroad in your heart, and it's to be employed. It's to be activated. But as long as I don't think that there's a point, as long as I'm separated and I don't realize that I'm part of the lift, you won't be encouraged to do anything. You know what you'll be? You'll be sidelined. There's Christians sidelined in this nation that aren't doing their call in their civil and, and social service, in our communities, in our schools, in our blah, blah, because it doesn't make a difference. What's the point? Blah, 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 blah. There's people that are sidelined in the church because of what has happened and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't, because the, there's people sidelined all through in marriages where they're not, they're not coming together like they're supposed to. Thankfulness. No, it's... Right before Thanksgiving, too. Isn't that kind of interesting? But so how do we get thankful? We look again. And this is why I wanted to receive communion today. And I'm going to read this before we receive it. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 26. He says this. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for, for you. Who was Jesus' body for? For you. For pastor? Absolutely. But equally for you. For your boss? Absolutely. But equally for you. Who could stand before the Lord? Could you stand before the Lord? Could you? I could not stand before the Lord if he kept track. So this is what happens. He says, and when he gave thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup after he had eaten and said, this is the new covenant, a new agreement in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26, and this is what I wanted to highlight on today as we receive communion. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim. Somebody say proclaim. You say something. You say thank you. You say thank you. Are you struggling with forgiveness? Are you struggling with authority? Are you struggling? Are you struggling in any of what we're talking about today? You know how one of the keys to get you and me to move into that place, to under authority and partner with God in all of our life is this right here. This is such a key to our health. This is a key to relationships. This is a key, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. Jesus, Jesus. This is the key. Here's what I'm doing. I'm proclaiming. I'm saying something. Lord, every care right here, every worry right here, eternity right here, the here and now right here, because of what he has and what this has done and made you and I sons and brought us into this place of under authority. He's our covering. He's our helper. He's our shepherd. He's the one that leads us and guides us. He's the one that keeps us. He's the one that chases after us. Thank you, Lord. And so today, um, why don't we just stand? Thank you, Lord. You can open your cups. Lord, you know my heart today. You know our hearts. And we take a moment right now to say thank you. Thank you for making the call before our call. Thank you for looking down and seeing us and making a way where there was no way. Thank you for paying the price even though it was the ultimate sacrifice. Because you said, it's worth it. Father, I thank you for just a work that you're doing in our hearts. Today, as we proclaim your son, Jesus, 
and his death as our payment. We take this bread that represents the body that was beaten for our sins. And we say thank you today for paying that price where we deserve punishment and we receive it. A body that was beaten for our healing. And we receive it in Jesus' name. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy. And we thank you. We lift this cup. We take this cup that represents the, the blood. Not just blood that was shed that day, but, Father, countless times where you laid down your life for those years leading up to where you presented yourself pure, holy, without spot. We lift up this. We say thank you for the blood, for doing what we couldn't. And we receive that, and we thank you for the strength, not only the forgiveness of sins, but to operate in the way that you did. You said life's in the blood. And so we, right now, we receive the forgiveness of sin, but we also thank you for your life that's poured out in our lives. In Jesus' name, we receive it. Father, I thank you for life in this house. I thank you for life to these people. I thank you for hope in hearts. And I thank you for the authority that you've placed in our lives. We, co we commit today to do as you said in Timothy, to pray for those in authority with thanksgiving. Lord, we lift up our bosses right now. You can do this right now. Before we're going to go, we're going to do this right here. Father, we lift up our bosses. We lift up those in authority. We lift up, you know who you're supposed to lift up. If you've had any kind of squam or squid like things, if you've been frustrated with the government, if you've been frustrated in any way, Father, we lift up right now those in authority. We lift up our senators. We lift up our president. We lift up every person in Congress. We lift up uh, the mayors and those that are to be elected in Alma. Father, we speak life into this place and we say thank you. Thank you for their yes. Thank you for their desire. Father, I thank you for even restoring to them the, the, the reason and the desire uh, that would be under your authority to run. Father, thank you uh, for, for service. Thank you for God I, I, ideas and God plans. Father, thank you. We lift up the bosses. We lift up the husbands. We lift up the school teachers right now. We lift up the coaches. We lift up our principals, Father. We lift them up before you. And we say, bless them. We say, thank you, Father. Bless them. Let them know you. Let them have visita visitations of you. Father, thank you. We say thank you this morning that we would be a people under your authority and therefore partnered with your plans here on this earth that in this place and in this house and with these people, you would have your way here on earth as it is in heaven. We say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. We're going to dismiss this morning. Um, before we do, if you, if you need healing in your body or if you came to church this morning and you say, hey, I want to give my life to Jesus, I want to meet you right here. If you need healing in your body or you, came, you just need to meet with Jesus this morning, come right up front and I'd love to pray with you. Other than that, we'll see you guys Wednesday night or Tuesday night uh, for the floats. God bless you.